Tracy there, please. This is. Hey, Tracy, this is Lee Aaron calling you. How are you? Hello. It is such a pleasure to talk with you. I've been a huge, huge admirer of yours since the 80s. I own all your records on vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Well, that's really flattering to hear. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I have to tell you, though, my friend and I have uh, the most unfortunate luck when it comes to getting the chance to see you perform live. I think there were two times we had tickets and the show ended up canceled after we got there. And this was back, you know, a long time ago. And it seems like every other time there was something that, that went wrong. And, uh, you know, we got to the point where, like, we're never going to see her. We're never going to see her. We now refer to it as the, the Lee Aaron effect when, when things go wrong. But please don't take that personally. <laughs> <laughs> really? So where, where are you located then? Um, I'm in Buffalo, New York. Oh, really? So uh, I'm trying to think of when I was scheduled to play down there and it got canceled. Oh, it probably had to be mid-90s or early oh. 90s, um, a little club near the airport. So. Yeah. Oh, that's a bummer. Well, you never know. I might make it to, I think there's a couple places. Is Niagara Falls far from you? or? Uh, no, not at all. It's about 20 minutes. So. Yeah, so I don't know, maybe at some point I'll make it out to the Niagara region. There just aren't as many places to play anymore, period, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I know. that's a problem. <laughs> oh, well, it's a, well, then it's really cool that I get to talk to you finally. Yeah. So after 11 years uh, on a hiatus, so to speak, you're back. Um, why did you choose now? Well, um, I always knew I would make another rock record. It was just a matter of when. Um, you know, and there were there were reasons. I mean, I've taken some interesting diversions throughout the course of my career. A lot of more diehard rock fans maybe don't really understand those choices, um, and that's okay. <laughs> but um, you know, I right now the reason I I've come back and I've made another rock record is I took a hiatus to I have my children. Mm -hmm. I had my daughter in 2004 and my son in 2006. Mm -hmm. So I've been busy um, putting all my creative energy into parenting <laughs> in the last 11 years. And if you've got kids, I'm sure you under I don't know if you do, but you'd understand. It's just, it takes an incredible amount of energy. Um, it's crazy. When I first had my, my daughter, I had this crazy idea that I would just, that she would just neatly slot right into my hectic rock and roll life and that I would just continue on. I'd, you know, just bring a, a car seat and take her along <laughs> and then, you know, hello. Right. <laughs> Giant wake up call. Um, yeah, and you realize you just have to make all these incredible adjustments to um for your child. So so that's basically what happened. Um and, you know, previous to that, uh I made you know, took some interesting artistic diversions. I I, mm -hmm. I experimented with um jazz music and I even actually was cast in a, an opera out in Vancouver and did a stint for a little while in a Baroque opera which was interesting and um, but you know I think all of those things have made me a better uh, more well-rounded performer and entertainer and songwriter and singer so yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you bring up the jazz record, and um, you know, for for those of our listeners that don't know, um, your your first album, um, you collaborated with Rick Emmett from Triumph. He's a, an accomplished guitar player, a fellow Canadian, and a uh, very personal favorite of mine, as as a lot of people know on on our site. But um, you know, he he also did the crossover into the jazz arena. Um, have you kept in touch with him? Would it be something that you might entertain of collaborating with him in the future on on a jazz or a rock record? Oh, I would certainly entertain collaborating with him at any point. He's I think he's a really gifted uh, guitarist and singer and writer. Uh, it's funny because you're not the first person who's brought that up to me. Um, so it's it's not something that. Um, it has been in the forefront of my mind to pursue, but certainly if it came up, it would be something I would would definitely consider doing because yeah. I really have a lot of respect for his talent, for yeah. sure. That would be fantastic. Um, you know, I know, too, there, there's some people that have kind of made a, a reappearance on the scene. You're not the only one. Lita Ford uh, being one, she's recently, um, you know, she came off of a pretty long uh, absence from the scene, and she recently put out a book, and... Uh, was she an influence on you at, at an early age? Um, well, it's interesting that you ask that because um, I had recently been, uh, I had recently told someone else this story that um, when I was, oh gee, probably 14 or 15 years old, 
my father and mother both worked at a college in Toronto, the Toronto area named Humber. I don't mm-hmm. know if you know Humber College. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, at one point, their radio station there was changing formats. I think that they were were making the big switch over from uh, vinyl to the short-lived uh, duration of eight track i think mm-hmm. <laughs> how long did eight track last but a year mm-hmm. <laughs> something mm-hmm. like that mm-hmm. and uh, they just decided they were going to get rid of their entire vinyl library so one day my dad arrived home with this trunk full of albums and up and that till that point believe me my my exposure to pop culture had been extremely limited i had a little transistor radio which was my sort of lifeline to reality Mm -hmm. and then my mom and dad had you know i think like a couple of roger whitaker and Anne marie albums that was about it Mm -hmm. so when he arrived with this trunk of vinyl i just started going through it and in that pile of vinyl i found you know fleetwood mac rumors elton john yellow brick road uh led zeppelin uh, a multiple led zeppelin albums um among others, Heart, Dream Boat Annie, which was huge. But in that pile were a couple of Runaways albums. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I had never, ever heard girls play rock mm-hmm. the way these girls played rock. And the fact that they were just a few years older than I was sort of made it extremely, uh, you know, I was able to um, make some serious connections there. Like, wow, you know, these girls are just a few years older than I am. They're picking up instruments. They're writing songs. So in a in a sort of indirect way, I think, yeah, Alita Ford was an influence on me um, because of those Runaways records. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people might consider you, you know, the, the Canadian response to, to her <laughs> in some ways. Um, but, uh, you know, in the book, she does talk about, you know, the challenges of being a woman in a male-dominated industry and the chauvinistic behaviors that she had to deal with, even from peers, you know, uh, and and the people she you know toured with and stuff and how much of that kind of stuff did you did you experience or run into while you were touring and recording well yeah i mean these days i think it's a lot more common for a woman to be able to pick up an instrument Mm -hmm. and play an aggressive style of music and be taken seriously but you got to remember the 80s was rife with um sexist no, yeah. attitudes, yeah. especially from, I wouldn't say just the music industry, but, I, you know, it was rife everywhere in yeah. pop, pop yeah. culture, but especially um, the advent of much music and MTV mm-hmm. around that time, you know, there was all, all of a sudden this new visual medium for people to be able to translate their musical ideas visually Mm -hmm. and so one thing that you commonly saw was women being objectified Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) in male rock videos Mm -hmm. and because of those strong visual images i think that that definitely flowed over into real life so Mm -hmm. yeah there was i think just a general attitude that you know if you looked good if you were Mm -hmm. attractive Mm -hmm there was almost, you were almost knocked down a level, like that you were all of us instantly not taken as seriously mm. as either a player or a writer. Mm. So there was that element mm. to it, mm. but there was also this element of, um, uh, what am I trying to say? If you were a, a woman, mm-hmm. um, you, you would also get a lot of attention because you were, um, an anomaly in that genre of music there were very very few women doing it Mm -hmm. so there was all of a sudden a lot of attention paid to you as well Mm -hmm. so there it was sort of you know it was kind of a curse and a blessing if you were a woman it was Mm -hmm. and you were half decent at your craft it was easy to get noticed but it was Mm -hmm. also easy to get dismissed and to be treated like you were a novelty right well i think you know people like yourself and lita and others you know they they have stood the test of time and you know, people had had would soon realize it was it was not just style over substance. You definitely had a, a gift and a talent, like you said, and something to offer just besides a pretty face. And um, well, you'd like you're, to think so. <laughs> and you're still here, and I think that's great. So let's talk about the new record, Fire and Gasoline. Um, is all of the material new, or did you have some stuff hanging around in your archives, or maybe stuff you worked on over over the years that kind of resurfaced? You know, I have a few things hanging around, but the reality is most of the material on Fire and Gasoline is brand new. There's one song called Bad Boyfriend. I had that sort of kicking around in 
I had played it in my live show for about the last five years, and mm -hmm. it always went over great. So mm -hmm. I did put that on the album. We, although we did take it into pre-production and do some work on it, and there were some, you know, um, arrangement revisions and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, the majority of the material is brand new. Okay. Um, um, it's, it's funny because you you sort of think you might pull all this material forward um, that you'd been archiving over that amount of time but when it came time to write a record I was sort of feeling that what I needed to do was write material that reflected really in the here and the now right um, 50 miles to Memphis is is my favorite song it's a, it's a very bluesy tune um, <laughs> when I first heard it I'm thinking hmm is this a continuation of Texas outlaw by chance <laughs> but uh, give us the inspiration behind that song it is kind of a, a continuation of the theme um, throughout my career, I have done songs that have had sort of that blues, southern rock kind of vibe to it. Mm -hmm. So there's Texas Outlaw, Outlaw, but there's a song on my um, Beautiful Things album from 2004 called Handcuffed to a Fence in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And that is a tune we play live that goes over really, really well. So I was actually thinking that 50 Miles was a com bit of a companion song to mm -hmm. those two songs. Wow, cool. Um, so what was the inspiration? You know, that song was just a, uh, it came to me on an airplane one, you know, we were flying into Calgary and Edmonton. It's two uh, towns up in Canada mm -hmm. that I play quite frequently. And they are, cow they are cowboy towns for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the inspiration for that song was, you know, what if you were, you know, um, you know, had been pushed to your absolute most violent, most worst behavior by the behavior of a spouse, right? Mm -hmm. You know, nothing is worse than feeling like you've been rejected or left. But what if you were were left, you know, f um, not for, if your spouse left you not for another woman, but for, say, another man, then the feelings that you had around that would be even more complex. So. Yeah. What would that look like, hmm. <laughs> and, and how would I put that into a blues rock song? So that that was sort of. Um, That's an interesting take yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, your songs are very autobiographical in nature in a lot of cases, and, and with this record, you deliver some serious emotional messages and concepts, uh, especially on find the love and, and heart fix. Want to comment a little bit on, on those two songs, or, or any others that you? Well, one might assume they're autobiographical, um, and perhaps a lot of, you know, what I find with the songwriting process is that sometimes when I'm struck with inspiration, like, I always feel that the best songs kind of write themselves. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the songs on the album were songs that came together very, very quickly for me, mm -hmm. and so their inspirations might have been autobiographical but by the by the time the songs go through the whole process of you know the lyrics being written and revised and the, the you know the, the music being fine-tuned quite often I don't really know exactly what they're about until they're completely finished and mm -hmm. I have a chance to listen back mm -hmm. and then sometimes those meanings take on new meanings if that makes any sense no, so it does for sure. um, the inspirations initially might have come from an autobiographical place but uh, like, for instance, the song Find the Love. Um, it was originally inspired by when I found out a friend of mine was very, very ill. Mm -hmm. She's since passed away. Mm -hmm. um, however, I've also had some circumstances over in the last couple of years of my life where I've lost more than that, that friend. My mother, for instance, is quite ill right now as well. And so that song started out... As the, the, the spark of inspiration was a friend of mine who became quite ill, mm -hmm. but when the song was finished, I realized this is a song for anybody who's lost anybody. Mm -hmm. And our lives at this stage of our, the game have all probably been touched by loss and death. And yeah, so, so unfortunately. Um, yeah. You know, I'd like to think that songs like that or songs that... that um, can mean different things to different people. Mm -hmm. That that people can listen to them and wa have you know, can they can pers put their own personalized stamp on them when they're hearing them. If that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and that that really for me is the goal when I'm writing in general. I think is for 
people to be able to interpret something slightly different and slightly apply something personal that you know works for their own lives to the songs. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. what you brought up before too about the video uh, era. You know, I think that really kind of as great as it was to launch a lot of careers, it did take away that um, that personal element for the listener because now they became a viewer as well, and so you were kind of led in a direction with the video in your brain instead of being left to use your own imagination to interpret the song the way that you wanted. Um, but no, I see, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. for sure. So. Um, Let's talk about the studio that you chose a little bit um, to record the the new record, Um, Little Farm Studio, which was formerly Little Mountain Studio um, in Vancouver. Um, How much does the aura of the studio affect the outcome and and the creative process? Hmm. It's interesting that you asked that. Um, You know, I, I personally think that the vibe of the studio can have a pretty dramatic effect on your uh, the outcome. Um, you know, it's just, just walking in there and seeing all those golden platinum albums on the walls and like there's such rich history there. Um, and just the rooms themselves, like, I mean, there was, you know, the the big space for recording drums and, um, I don't know how I explain it. It would have. Been, I think that the outcome and the entire vibe of that album would have been completely different if we'd gone into someone's small little project studio. Mm-hmm. Put it that way. And I mean, there's there's plenty of those around that exist now, and plenty of those that do high quality sounding things. I mean, with the advent of digital technology and Pro Tools, and mm-hmm. you can produce pretty much any. You can you know make a record in your your <laughs> office for goodness sakes <laughs> these days, right? Mm-hmm. But um, but largely, those types of records that are made in those small project studios are piecemealed together that mm-hmm. way because you don't have the big room where you can actually put the entire band together in the same environment and mic them all up and have them play live off the floor. Mm-hmm. You know, And that was really my goal with this album is I wanted it to be a real band. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we... I think really effectively accomplished in the end mm. was it had the the vibe of a real band playing in real time and you know live off the floor and so I'm I'm pretty pleased about that outcome. That's great. So do you feel that the technology has has changed the industry for the good or the bad or kind of both? I mean if you compare the the way that the things are done nowadays as compared to you know, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. I mean, you don't even have to be in the same country to, to collaborate with somebody and make a record, you know. You're absolutely right. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, at the risk of sounding like a grumpy old fart, <laughs> i say, you know, I think it, I think this, the state of pop music is pretty sad yeah. these days. Yeah. I think that people, the reason that you had, like, say, for instance, the tremendous success of an artist like Adele, because people were like, wow, someone's actually really, really singing without, <laughs> like, massive pitch correction. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, so I think people are absolutely hungry for things that sound human. Mm-hmm. And then, with, like I said, the advent of digital technology, you don't even have to know how to play your instrument mm-hmm. anymore. You mm-hmm. just had... You all you need to know how to do is play three chords and program a loop. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And yeah. so much music these days is constructed that way. So what you have is you don't have a new generation of people that really, really know how to play their instruments and really, really know how to write songs and really, really know their craft. Yeah. I mean, there's something to be said for the 10,000 hours, for sure. Oh, yeah. You know, if you've met read any Malcolm Gladwell. Um, but... You, you know, so what we do is we have a, new, a generation of people that know how to use touch screens mm-hmm. and program mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's changing the heart, you know, the way that, that music is constructed yeah. and music is, is played and, well, or not played and music is put together. I mean, when you, I mean, I'm sure you've seen things floating around on Facebook where, you know, they, they've compared, you know, um, you know, here's a, 
a Joni Mitchell tune or compared to a Beyonce tune where, you know, and the lyrics are so dense on mm -hmm. the Joni Mitchell and have such depth of meaning mm -hmm. and interpretation and, you know, not to criticize Beyonce. I mean, I think she's a, a wonderful singer, but, and here there's, you know, there's one writer on the Joni Mitchell tune, there's, there's seven or eight writers on the Beyonce song and, you know, the deepest lyric is, you know, ooh, shake your <laughs> booty or whatever it is. You know, I'm not a big, I don't know a lot of Beyonce songs, but, you know, yeah. you know, a couple of lines that get repeated over and over again yeah. that mean absolutely right. nothing. Right. No, I, I think really? the, the word depth is a great, great term to use because, like you said, there's nothing that's going to replace a whole band being in a room and, and feeding off each other's energy and ideas and the, the laughs and the, you know, like you said, a human element or a depth to it is, it definitely crosses over into the final product, I, I think, too. I agree Absolutely. with you 100%. So, um, your daughter appears in the, the Tomboy video. Does she want to pursue a career in music or entertainment? <laughs> you know what? She actually loves musical theater, and mm -hmm. she goes to a fine arts school, and so she is, I think that um, in, a, in an ideal world, I think she'd love to, you know, be the star in Wicked. <laughs> you know, I've taken her to quite a few productions, and uh, she asks me a lot of questions around it. So what does it take to be, you know, be in a musical production like that, Mom, as opposed to this musical theater company that I'm in? And, you know, so I, you know, I'm pretty honest with her about, you know, what the music industry looks like and how competitive it is. And so I think that, um, like, both of our children are musical, mm -hmm. musically inclined, and... Um, are very very creative uh, you know she also loves dogs so she might end up being a vet okay. you know I don't I don't really know at this point she's yeah. only 11 years old yeah. but um, you know for me it's we, we we have multiple instruments around our home we have a couple pianos I've got I don't know about seven guitars downstairs my husband has about 16 drum kits wow. you know <laughs> so there's instruments all over our house if they want to learn to be um, a player, they can at any point in time. We've not forced our children to take musical lessons of any kind, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you why. Is only because I, you know, the, you know, I meet families where you know they've got a five or a seven year old, and they're on their third year of piano, and they're, the child hates practicing mm -hmm. because I just don't think young children have the discipline mm -hmm. to want to put the time into it they should be out to me i think they should be spending their creative energy outside playing with rocks and sticks mm -hmm. and digging dirts in the <laughs> ground digging holes in the ground i mean you know what i mean doing yeah. and you know doing things like that and if they are passionate and want to play an instrument believe me they're going to let me know mm -hmm. you know you can you can become a great musician and not start playing till you're 15 mm -hmm. but um you know i I, and right now, when they sit down, you know, Angela's figured out that she can make chords on the piano and that she she picks things out by ear. Mm -hmm. I want her to sit down and play, you know, experiment with an instrument because she there's joy in it for her, right. not because she's forced to do it. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, yeah, whatever our kids decide to do, yeah. you know, we're going to support them 100%. Yeah. And... Uh, that's fantastic. I do. I do yeah. feel that they probably will both end up doing something creative. Yeah. So. Yeah. What are yeah. they? What are they? What are their comments when they look at old pictures of you, or or even the earlier records and stuff? What What is their, you know, like? Oh my God, <laughs> Mom! Or, you know. Well, you know, it's just recently that they've started to make this connection. That wow, you know, our mom was actually at one point a pretty big deal <laughs> because, because they're you know their connection to me is from birth right. on, and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm the lady that makes the craft dinner. <laughs> or, you know, I actually can cook some things beyond that, believe it or not. <laughs> I'm not completely culinarily challenged, but, um, you know, I'm their, their, their parent, right? Mm -hmm. I'm their mom. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's interesting because we, yesterday, I'm quite jet-lagged because I just <laughs> flew from, um, well, from Mexico a couple of days ago and then from Vancouver to Ontario oh, wow. last night and got in about 3 o'clock in the morning. Oh. 
Um, but I'm at my parents' place right now because um, I've come to, to visit them for Easter. Oh. And uh, as we were getting ready for bed last night, there's a picture of me on the wall when I'm about 18, and my daughter's looking at it. She goes, is that you? And I'm like, yeah. And she goes, it, it looks like you, Mom, but, you know, because yeah. I had a perm back then. She's like, your hair looks different. I'm like, well... I'm glad I'm still recognizable. Honey. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, um, so. Well, great. So it's interesting. Um, senior, you need to get some sleep. Well, we'll do a couple of quick questions here and, sure. and wrap it. I hear some fun ones. Um, so, what's in your CD player right now, off the top of your head? Oh, um, I think the new Courtney Barnett. Okay. <laughs> Are you familiar with her? I'm not. Oh, you'd have to look her up. She's okay. from Australia. Okay. She's a guitar player, singer. She's like a, she's like a punk rock Bob Dylan, and she's a female. Oh, okay. And she's from Australia. She's a, totally amazing. You have to look her up. Okay, I will do that. Um, and do you still play the saxophone? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't picked it up in years. I have to be honest. I, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just not something that's uh, made it into my new rock. Yeah. Well, was <laughs> and, I'm too, and I was far too intimidated when I was doing jazz to ever pick it up because there's, you know, 8,000 guys in Vancouver <laughs> who are way, way better than me. <laughs> well, with 16 drum sets in your house, I don't think there'd be even room to have one. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, What is the craziest request or, or act of adoration you ever received from a, a fan or admirer? One of the craziest things, and it, it's happened multiple times, where I have autographed someone's skin, mm -hmm. and they said they're going to go get it tattooed. And I just, <laughs> yeah. I, in fact, as recently as last August, I was playing a show in Vancouver, and I autographed a girl's, you know, shoulder, and she's like, oh, I'm getting this tattooed tomorrow. And I was, I was begging her friend, you know, talk her out of it. <laughs> you know, it's it's one thing to, you know, Especially, you know, with a younger girl. She was about 18. Mm -hmm. I thought it's, you know, maybe five years from now, you won't even like Leanne anymore. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to be like the bad boyfriend tattoo, <laughs> right? Where they wake up one day and go, wow, you know, it was really, you know, Leanne is cool and she's inspiring and, you know, there's lots of things to take away from that. But I really wish I hadn't gotten that light Leanne tattoo on my back when yeah. I was 18. Yeah. You know, right. um, just because... I think the only tattoos you should ever get are, you know, tattoos of family members you know are never, ever going to be leaving your life. Right, right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, you know, people when they're young do silly things, but um, what was maybe, I mean, when you first realized some success, I'm sure you maybe splurged or did something that you wouldn't do now, but what, what was maybe one of the first things you splurged on when you got your first taste of success? Oh, boy. I always wish these were internet questions. <laughs> so you can think longer? <laughs> is, is this a podcast? Or is this, um, it'll you know? be audio. It'll be audio. It'll be an audio. Yeah. Uh, what was my craziest splurge? Um, oh, gosh. I don't know. Probably my, my custom-made pink leather rocker, <laughs> like, which is still a trademark. I still have one in my closet. Okay. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> name a guilty pleasure of yours that your fans would be surprised to learn. Like, I don't know, do you get up at 3 in the morning and eat a bowl of Lucky Charms or something? I don't know. Oh, uh, <laughs> a guilty pleasure that's my, um, oh, boy, let me think about that for a sec. Um, like, again, I said I, I hate these on-the-spot questions, especially <laughs> when I'm sleep-deprived. Um, you know. Makes for more interesting answers sometimes. <laughs> There's a, I interviewed a, a girl from Canada, a singer, Biff Naked. I don't know if you're aware of her. Oh, yeah, but, I know uh, Biff. She yeah. said her guilty pleasure was Bubblicious Gum. And she said she was on tour uh, one year and she said she ate so much or, you know, chewed so much of this gum by the time she got back, she had like four cavities. <laughs> uh. 
<laughs> That's hysterical. Um, you know, one of my guilty pleasures is, is sometimes, mm-hmm. secretly, I listen to Madonna when I'm working out. <laughs> okay, all right, that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> As I'm voguing on the treadmill, <laughs> I'm thinking of her hard body and how I wish I had one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she had a little meltdown recently, but yeah, uh, she. I have to give her credit. She still looks pretty fantastic for for her age. So, oh boy. <laughs> Um, I'm sure she. I'm for, <laughs> she has the finances to have a little bit of. Yeah, a little help. Well. Yeah, yeah. So, do you have um, some dates planned to come into upstate New York or in the states in general for the summer? I'm, I'm sure you have some things on the calendar as far as festivals and things. Well, go. my calendar is just starting to fill up for the summer. Usually, what happens is this in the spring is when I start bake, booking festival dates and mm-hmm. and shows. And um, I know that um, at this point in time. The plan, I am going to be getting to the Ontario region around the end of June because I have a couple of festivals booked there. Um, But you know what? You've got it on my, very present in my mind now. So I'm going to get on the phone to my agent in in the next couple of days and say, hey, what about a date in the Niagara area? (laughs) That would be great. It has been forever since I played down there. Yeah, yeah. Um, And it's probably just due to the fact that it's not as conducive to... You know, if you're bringing a band out from Vancouver, I need a you know a proper anchor date yeah. to be able to fly my entire band out. But mm-hmm. um, but tagging on a date in the Niagara area might certainly be yeah. a possibility. So, yeah, yeah. there are for some that reminder. Yeah, there are some cool venues now. Um, what would you recommend in downtown Buffalo? Oh boy, there's um, well, there's the Trelf that's been there for forever. Um, that's right in in the city. Um, there's the town ballroom. Um, there's the waiting room. Um, Rapids Theater in Niagara Falls. Um, there was, there's been a couple of shows there recently that were packed, and um, a lot of bands go there. So there's a few that I can recommend. But, but yeah, cool. this, this, definitely look into that because I know there's, there's a lot of people that I know that that still know that know your name when I bring it up, and and I think it would be great to to have you come here and and put a show on for us. So. But um, it was my honor to talk to you today, Lee. Thank you so much. I wish you continued success. And for God's sake, go kick some ass out there. The world needs you. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's amazing. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, it was great talking to you, too. Okay, have a wonderful holiday. And, um, you know, I hope to see you out there. Yeah, have a great Easter. Okay, thanks. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, do what you say, say what you mean.